back on God's grace. What else can God do for you? What else can He do to save you? God has done everything. Do you understand that? God has made every provision you will ever need to get through this life and get through it with joy and peace and happiness and never have to ride that roller coaster of belief on belief, belief on belief, belief on belief. Okay? This is why when you read Hebrews, the faith chapter, and it goes through all the list of those names, this is why those people were in there. Because they believed that God's promises were true and they were willing to die for it. Okay? And they died in faith, knowing that God was powerful enough that even if they didn't see the promise, that God is faithful. That if their family, if their friends, if their whole nation rejected them, it's better to be on God's side alone than to stand with a whole nation of unbelievers. Amen? Amen. That's easy to say, but hard to do. Or is your faith strong enough to allow you to stand... around people who don't believe the same way you do, around people who make fun of what you believe in? Does your faith shrink in those situations? Christ has called you to be a light, and if He's living in you, there's nothing that can stand against you. Okay, so... Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with, what's that last two words? Exceeding joy. Exceeding joy. Now turn with me back to Romans chapter 3. Romans 3 verses 21 through 24. And in these set of verses, brothers and sisters, is why you have the assurance that you have. This is why your assurance is not based on your performance. It's based on what God has done. And it is already a done deal. You need to realize that and understand that. If you're expecting your righteousness to be enough to stand before God and say, will you accept me? It's never going to work. But God has already known that, and God has given us everything we need to compensate for that and to overcome this fallen flesh and this fallen nature. And we find that here in Romans. So Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 24 says, But now the righteousness of who? Okay? It doesn't say the righteousness of John. It doesn't say the righteousness of the congregation. It says, now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Verse 22, even the righteousness of God. How? Through faith in Jesus Christ, to all and on all who believe. This is why faith is so important. Number one, who does the righteousness come from? Jesus Christ. Okay. Is Christ perfect? Yes. Is Christ God? Yes. So you're talking the righteousness of God has now been given to you. Is that good news? Amen. Amen. Is that something to be excited about? Yes. Now, do you deal with sin? Does that make you depressed? This should give you exceeding joy. Why? Because you do not have to stay in your sin. Sin does not have to control you. Sin does not have to be any part of your life. Because we have a righteousness that comes from God. Is there any other, is there any higher righteousness than that? So listen, do you understand now why he's able to present you faultless before his throne? Do you understand now why Christ is the author and the finisher of your faith? 
and that it is faith in Christ that you are saved by grace, not by works, lest any man should boast. When it comes to our own works, if we try to please and appease God with our own works, how does God view that? Filthy rags, right? He ain't talking about bad works. He's talking about good works. And to God, it's filthy rags. Why? Because we are inherently sinful. Outside of Christ, what hope do we have? This is why you can say with all confidence, with all love, with all hope, that there is only one way to approach God. And that one way is through His Son, Jesus Christ. There is not many roads to heaven. There's many roads to hell. Right. There's one road. And there's one way. And that way is Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. Do you understand why it has to be that way? Am I narrow-minded when it comes to that? Yes, I am. Because I understand what Christ has done for me. I can never, ever do enough work to pay for one sin. One, let alone a lifetime of them. Nor do I have power to overcome sin. Why? Because this fallen flesh is enmity against God and against His law and against everything that's good and just and right. And so what I need is some type of power from outside who is able to come and change me on the inside, and that's only comes from God and the indwelling of His Holy Spirit. Amen. So, let's turn to Romans 5 and look at verses 1 through 5. So we find that the righteousness comes from God, and the Bible tells us that this righteousness that comes from God is called a gift. Why is that a gift? There's many reasons, but the main reason is because you will never produce that kind of righteousness yourself. And it's something that you need, and it's something that God freely gives. That's what I was going to ask you. Is there strings attached to this gift? The gift has been given to the entire world. The world has been reconciled to God in Christ. So the world can be saved. Does that mean, again, we went over this in our Sabbath school class, does that mean everybody's going to be saved? No. What makes the difference between those that will and those that won't? Those that actually take the gift receive it, open it up, and make it a part of themselves, right? That's faith, faith, that God hands me the gift. I take the gift. I don't just put the gift aside and go, well, I'm busy, I'll get back to that later. But I open it up, and I see what God has done for me. And I see the love that He has for me, and I see the power that is in His Christ. And I see the power that comes from the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And I realize that everything, everything I've been looking for, the power to overcome sin, the power to change this, this inside of me, all comes with this gift. The power to actually start to emulate and take on the character of Jesus Christ, that, brothers and sisters, is what I want most in my life. I want to be like Christ. I want to be able to treat people the way He did. I want to be able to have the publicans and the sinners drawn to me instead of chasing them away. Okay, Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Therefore, having been justified by faith, what do we have? So listen. Because you have been justified, now you have peace with God. You should not lie awake at night in your bed, anxious and worried about your relationship with God. Because Christ has taken care of that. 
And because you're justified, you have peace with Him. And because you have peace with Him, you can now live for Him. And if you're living for Him, His Spirit dwells within you. And His Spirit will produce works of righteousness. Is that good news? A lot of people have that backwards. They go, before I come to God, I need to clean myself up. I need to change a lot of things. It never happens. Okay? Then they come to God, and then they worry about still cleaning themselves up and changing a bunch of things. Instead of resting in Christ and allowing the Holy Spirit to make the changes. Why do we keep the Sabbath? Do we keep it because we want to be legalists? What is this rest that we find in Sabbath keeping? When you look at the Sabbath in the Gospel, what you find is a very beautiful picture of what I've been trying to put into words this morning, and sometimes it's a very hard thing. God has given you the Sabbath. So that you can look and you realize, why do we rest? Because God rested. Why did God rest? Was He tired? It's because what God did at the end of the sixth day, He looked and He saw everything He made. And what did He say? Behold, it is very good. And everything was complete. Nothing more could be added. Nothing more could be done. And so He rested in that completeness. And we keep Sabbath because we rest in the completeness of the salvation that we find in Christ. Amen? Amen? You start to understand that and you start to understand the beauty of why God has given us this one day every week so that we can come, we can rest, and we can have that time to meditate and contemplate all that He's done for us. You are complete in Jesus Christ. Nothing more can be added. Nothing more can be done. You rest in Him. So therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, to whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in, what's that word? Are you sure that's not a misprint? How many of you guys glory in tribulation? But listen, that is something that is supernatural. That is something that God can do in your heart. And this is why God allows pain and hard circumstances to come into your life. Why? Because He's teaching you and He's making you grow in your faith and in your maturity so you can become the perfect man or woman or child in Christ. Amen? Amen. Do we need tribulation? Yes. Oh, that was kind of weak too. Listen, why do you think there's going to come a time of trouble? Do we need tribulation? Yes. yes. Do we need trouble? Yes. Because that is one of the most powerful tools that God has to get our attention. It's also one of the most powerful tools to drive us to the point of submission to God and to show us where our hearts are really at. You have more people asking you deeper and sincere questions about God, about life, about salvation at a funeral than you ever do at a wedding. Do you know why that is? Because at a funeral, you're dealing with serious, serious issues that if you're not in the casket, you know one day, you may be, if Christ doesn't come back. Okay? And it gets people to think, and they're more inclined to listen and to actually dwell on spiritual things. So, not only that, this is verse 3 of chapter 5 of Romans, but not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulations produces perseverance. Now, as you get to these next set of verses, do you think that he just haphazardly put this order together? Study this. Really study this because this is what God is trying to tell you of why you deal with the painful things you deal with. Okay? 
because it is for a much greater purpose, and that's the glory of God manifested in you. We also glory in tribulation. Why tribulation? Because tribulation produces what? Perseverance. And what does perseverance do for us? Perseverance produces character. Whose character? Christ. Yep. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And that character produces what? Hope. What hope? The hope that all this that you experience and all this that you endure. And all this that you believe in is not just a fairy tale hope, but it is a solid hope built on fact, the very truth of God's word, and all these things are working in you to prepare you to meet your God and Savior face to face. How will you stand in front of a holy and righteous God? I tell you, you stand there with a smile on your face because Christ has lived in your heart. You stand there with your arms open going, Lord, this is our God. He is going to save us. You stand there knowing that God is not against you. God is not mad at you, but God has come back because He loves you. That's how you stand in front of a righteous God. Amen? Amen. But you only do that if you are in Christ, if you have that faith, if you live in the Spirit. And stop allowing your flesh to control you. I get to go to 1230. Oh, I just changed 1230. <laughs> All right. Listen, if you write these down, here's some more scriptures for you. Oh, I actually got them all. Okay. So, Jesus is our all in all. He never lets go of us, He never gives up on us, and He never turns away from us. And because of that, we should never turn away from Him. Who can save you from your sin if you turn away from Christ? Who can change your selfish heart if you turn away from Christ? Who can heal you of all your pain if you turn away from Christ? The book of Hebrews was written because the Hebrew Christians were turning away from Christ and trying to find salvation back in the temple services. The writer of Hebrews was trying to get their attention and saying, listen, salvation is not found there anymore because everything that those services were talking about has found its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. And if you turn away from Him, and you turn your back on this great grace that God has given, what more can God do for you? You have an assurance of salvation in Christ. So keep holding His hand and allow Him to take you all the way through to the end. Have perseverance have endurance, because he who endures to the end will what? Do you know the text? He who endures to the end will be saved. Our closing hymn this morning is hymn number 524. <laughs>
remember that those um, green sheets of paper, Donald has a plate in the back, uh, put them in as you leave. Let's bow our heads as we close. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this beautiful Sabbath day. Thank you for the precious truths that are contained in your word. Father, I pray that you help us to be like the Bereans, that we don't just listen and hear, but we go back and actually study your word to see if these things are true. Father, I pray that you will bless us, that you will open our hearts and our minds to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and that you will change us day by day from glory to glory into the image of your Son. Amen. Help us to be that generation that will be used to prepare people to meet you when we come back. For this we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.